Hello, everyone, and welcome to May More Madness. We're making one video about Moa every week for the month of May. Or at least we were supposed to. Unfortunately, we're already over halfway through May, and I'm only on video two. But hey, life is annoying. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about something I haven't seen anyone on YouTube talk about before, which is the influence of Moa on plant evolution. As we discussed in our last video on the origins of Moa, for at least 20 million years until only a few hundred years ago, Moa a lineage of mostly large flightless birds, were the only large grazers and browsers on Aotearoa, New Zealand, due to the absence of mammals from the islands. So, how did the trees, shrubs, and herbs that are present here adapt to browsing by these animals? Well, let's look at some examples that have been discussed in the literature. All of the examples we're going to talk about in this video come from this paper by Greenwood and Atkinson, this paper by C. L. Batchelor, and this great article in Naturalis Historia, all of which are linked in the description. This is an acephila. And so is this. There are quite a few of these nightmare-inducingly weird-looking tussocks in Aotearoa, New Zealand, most of which live in grasslands and in mountainy areas, especially on the South Island. These plants are really, really interesting. Despite looking like grasses and even sometimes being called spear grasses, they're actually a member of the carrot family and are surprisingly closely related to a large number of edible herbs, and their leaves are rich in sugar. To protect the plant from being grazed, Acephila's leaflets evolved into hard, upward-pointing spikes and their flowers are just as horrifying. But here's where things get interesting, because as Greenwood and Atkinson discuss, these spikes are completely useless against smaller exotic mammals, especially rabbits, which munch at the leaves from the sides. Acephila did not evolve in a habitat with smaller grazers that could do this, and its defense works best against a grazer coming in from above like a rat-eyed bird with a long neck and a downward-pointing head. Example number two. A large number of very common plant species here have become very poisonous to protect themselves from grazing, including the vine supplejack and the trees tutu, kamahi, mahoe, and porokaifiri. As C. L. Batchelor notes, many of these species have non-poisonous relatives elsewhere, and if they developed poisonous compounds elsewhere, it's unlikely that they would continue to expend energy producing these toxins if they were not advantageous to the plant's survival here as well. Therefore, Batchelor concludes that herbivores are the only reason that we have so many poisonous woody plants today in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And thanks to these poisons, some of the plants we have here have even taken to mimicry. Pseudowintera colorata, or horopito, is a small tree or shrub that is common in the forest understories of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's slightly poisonous and tastes horrible. And as Greenwood and Atkinson note, it looks really, really, really similar to another rarer shrub, which is not all that closely related, called Toropapa, or Alciosmia pusilla. They point out that while Horopito is poisonous and bad tasting, grazing species find Toropapa very palatable, and happily munch on it. They suggest that Toropapa, therefore, had actually evolved to mimic Horopito, since there's no obvious reason why it would look so unbelievably similar. That way, browsers, of which the only ones to exist in Aotearoa were Moa, would avoid eating them because they would assume that they were going to eat a horopito and get an upset stomach. Something more weird about New Zealand plant evolution is the sheer number of plants which grow in a so-called divaricating habit. 
i.e. having small leaves and interlaced, often zigzagging branching, tough stems that branch off divergently at very wide angles. Divaricating shrubs are found in every habitat here but are completely absent from other Pacific islands and rare outside of Aotearoa. What's really weird is that this growth habit has shown up in several plant families independently. There doesn't seem to be any correlation between the presence of these species and the wetness or dryness or temperature or wind conditions in a particular area, which indicates that browsing was the likely driving factor in this morphology repeatedly evolving. Divaricating shrubs are often notable for having more leaves on the branches in the interior part of the shrub than in the exterior, especially in the extreme example of the porcupine shrub Melisetus alpinus, in which the near bare branches on the outside effectively form a hard protective wall that protects the leaves on the inside. By having small leaves and a complex mass of mostly bare hard branches, divaricating shrubs make themselves come across as extremely unpalatable to browsers and very challenging to pick leaves from for an animal with a beak and no hands. So, thanks to Moa, we have tons of cool shrubs which all look confusingly similar. Greenwood and Atkinson also noted that in some populations of the common divaricating shrubs Kaikomako, which is Penantia corimbosa, and Caprosma rhamnoides, there's an extra trick where new spring growth is coloured to look like old dead growth, so that Moa would be even less likely to browse from them. Now on to another cool tree. This is Pseudopanax crassifolius, known in Tereo Maori as Horoeka and in English as Lancewood. And this is its close relative, Pseudopanax ferox or fierce lancewood. These trees are weird. When they're small, they have long, hard leaves with jagged edges. In lancewood, these are downward-facing points, which could almost be called thorns, and in fierce lancewood, they are proportionally huge, jagged teeth. But then when these trees get taller than around 3 or 4 meters, they suddenly stop producing these weird leaves and make more normal looking lance shaped leaves. So what's going on? Well, young saplings of any tree would be at the greatest risk of having all of their leaves eaten and dying as a result of a bunch of mower walking through the patch of forest they were growing in. So this creates a selection pressure to make your leaves, as a young tree, as hard to eat as possible. We know from pollen in moa feces that moa did feed on pseudopanax, so these species, which moa liked to eat, needed to evolve a defense mechanism. Now moa, being birds, were unable to properly chew, as unlike mammals, they had no teeth and they couldn't move their jaws side to side. The only way for them to feed was to break off chunks of plant, then toss their head back to throw chunks into their throats and leaves like these seem custom made to get stuck in a mower's throat, making them very, very unpalatable for the animal, and likely an extremely unpleasant experience to try to eat. This has made lancewoods very successful. You can find horoeca in particular in pretty much any forest habitat type, and I've seen them in several scrub and even wetland habitats too. Unfortunately, this great survival technique does come with a price. These thin, strap-like juvenile leaves, which are also dark and brownish in colour, presumably to make them look even more unpalatable to moa, are kind of bad at converting energy from the sun into photosynthesis. So, the young plants grow very, very slowly when compared to other members of their genus that don't grow in this way. It's notable that they only stop producing these leaves once the tree reaches above a giant mower's head height, since when they get tall enough, having leaves that are actually effective at absorbing sunlight makes a lot more sense for the species' survival, 
and helps the tree grow faster and larger now that they're no longer at risk of being munched on by a mower. Anyway, I hope you found this as interesting as I did. Next time on May Mower Madness! We'll be talking about the crested mower and why it was the best mower. Probably. Maybe. I don't know. But anyway, it's onward to our weekly segment of Rockman. Hello everyone, and welcome to our weekly game of Rockman. What's Rockman? Well, it's basically Hangman, except if I win, I summon a giant rock monster out of these stones which takes over the world. Every week, you guess a letter. If the letter is correct, it goes on the board. And if the letter is incorrect, then I put another rock on Rockman and get one step closer to world domination. Last week, the best performing guess for a letter was not a guess for the letter. It was a guess of the actual answer. So, under the rules of Rockman, I must concede my defeat. You, my audience, have defeated me. The answer is, of course, Niso's banding, which is a metamorphic texture which forms as a result of high temperature and pressures being exposed to mudstones over a long period of time after they've gone through the phase of having been converted into a schist. We'll be talking about Niso's banding in a future video now that you guys have guessed the answer. So, I've lost and Rockman is not going to help me take over the world. Damn! This means, even more unfortunately, that you guys are going to need to come up with a forfeit for me in the next episode. Yay! That's not scary. So, put your suggestions for a forfeit in the comments below, and I guess I'll have to do whatever the most upvoted one is. Huge shout out to our wonderful patrons, especially our 4 -am tier supporters, Iris and Geneva. Also, massive thanks to our Dilophosaurus tier patron, Hours, and to our Radiolarian tier patrons, Glenn Collins, Rowan Utting, and Jean and Eric Feenstra. See you next time!